really have been looking forward to uh, to share with you uh, both published and unpublished uh, data from our group. So you're completely right. Uh, my talk uh, is centered around the liver alpha cell axis uh, in context of type two diabetes and fatty liver. So let's have a go. So as you all are aware of, every third person in the world has a metabolic disease and those ranging from obesity to fatty liver disease. This is a central, uh, uh, a central focus here of my talk now. Diabetes, atherosclerosis, dyslipidemia, and so forth, right? So one of the um, exploding field that has been uh, from the proglucagon derived peptides, and, and I call this the paradise of drug targets. And what do I mean with that? So here we see the uh, proglucagon, a precursor to hormones that you are very uh, well aware of. We just heard about GLP-1 and GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, but what I've been spending the last uh, roughly 10 years on about that is uh, glucagon. So let's, let's see what glucagon can do for you. So I just think we need to recognize uh, one of the many important uh, contributor to glucagon biology, and that is uh, Dr. Roger Unger, which we unfortunately la lost uh, last year. And he was a pioneer in, in glucagon biology and not only measurement of glucagon biology, and that's an important point here. So um, in 1978, him and his uh, colleague Raskin showed that um, the difference um, between non, uh, uh, persons without uh, diabetes and those with type two diabetes were actually uh, increased plasma levels of glucagon. This is important because for then for the last 40 years or so, um, glucagon receptor antagonist has been developed. And as you can see here, uh, the um, a glycated hemoglobin, which is a surrogate marker of glucose is significantly reduced uh, dose dependently, and this is just one of many glucagon receptor antagonists. Just to mention that glucagon agonism is also extremely hard from many perspectives, not only a fatty liver disease. So I think we should keep our eyes open for that. So one of the things we uh, have observed together with colleagues is that uh, this hyperglucagonemia, meaning increased levels of glucagon, may actually exist in, independent of diabetes. So ranging from glucagon being a, a centric uh, a, a thing in diabetes, we, we may actually need to expand this understanding to also capture uh, this um, feedback axis, which we term the liver alpha cell axis and is uh, impaired in fatty liver disease. This is what the data I'm going to show you today. So what is the action of glucagon? I'm sure John will tell you much more about it, but this is just one of many reviews about it. And uh, the focus here is really on the liver. So as you can see, glucagon has a range of physiological and also pharmacological uh, effects. And uh, just a take home message from my side is that we need to uh, differentiate between physiology and pharmacology. These are two different, uh, co completely different aspects uh, when we talk about glucagon biology. So what is the liver alpha cell axis? Uh, as you can see here, many different groups has been involved in, involved in, in, in the liver alpha cell axis. And I think uh, one of the key persons that was a, a study by Soloway and colleagues published in Cell Reports actually demonstrating that indeed it is the amino acids and glucagon that's, that, that, that um, feed back uh, each other's both secretion and in uh, animal models perhaps also proliferation. So the idea is that a certain am amino acids, the glucagonotropic amino acids, stimulates glucagon secretion from pancreatic alpha cells, and glucagon binds to its uh, cognate receptor in liver cells, and within the liver, uh, glucagon actually enhances a biochemical process known as urea cycle. So urea cycle is a keen uh, uh, a process that is uh, needed or required to dispose the toxic uh, ammonia from uh, a, a amino acids and the uh, byproduct is then urea. So this is how it looks like in healthy individuals and healthy mice as well. So just to phrase it very shortly, the liver alpha cell axis is a feedback loop by which amino acid catabolism turnover is controlled by glucagon dependent mechanism. So let's have a look. So the first step to um, understand this feedback, this interorgan feedback is to see 
the amino acid stimulated glucagon secretion. Nothing new about, about that, but this is a fellow of mine, Sasha, who in humans have nicely shown by also a variety of doses that amino acids dose dependently stimulate glucagon. So this is not breakthrough at all. <laughs> the second thing, which I think is, is perhaps even more interesting that Katrine, a PhD fellow, she mapped all the different amino acids in a physiological system term as the uh, uh, isolated perfused pancreas in mice. And what you can show, or what we could show here is that indeed uh, this um, one of the most glucagon stimulating amino acids is alanine. So, well, that was just one aspect of the liver alpha cell axis. Now we need to look about the effect of glucagon on amino acid catabolism. And we, we, we've done a series of studies and some of them is published as you can see here and a range is not published. So one of the things we did were to use mass spectrometry or state of the art technology as you might call it. And we tried to differentiate between um, age and gender match mice to glucagon receptor knockout mice using this um, analysis. And here we were looking at both proteins and metabolites. And what we could clearly see based on these data set that indeed some of the things that we measured in plasma from these animals could easily discriminate the normal mice from mice lacking the glucagon receptor. The question is, what could this be? Well, this is a volcano plot showing you the full change on the x-axis and the log um, p-value on the y-axis. And you can see there's a variety of metabolites and proteins that is actually uh, um, upregulated uh, in the glucagon receptor knockout. But one thing that really uh, uh, striked us was that the most significant, the most um, uh, uh, the metabolite that was mostly affected was at least amino acid. So Sasha, uh, whom I just introduced, uh, have given uh, glucagon in, in humans, uh, both with and without uh, hepatic steatosis. And this is just a control experiment showing the difference of saline and glucagon on the plasma, on the circulating pool of amino acids after overnight phase in healthy individuals. And as you can see here, Glucagon within minutes, so, so now we're talking about non-transcriptional changes, uh, reduces plasma concentration of amino acids. The question is, how can it do this? Um, urogenesis, we believe, is a key concept. And uh, Marie, uh, a PhD fellow in our lab, she's done a series of work and is doing a series of work trying to uh, understand how glucagon at a molecular level actually enhances urogenesis. So one of the things we use or one of the models is the diphtheria toxin in mice. So we uh, inject diphtheria and thereby by uh, uh, a genetic model, we can then reduce the amount of glucagon in the alpha cells while still keeping actually uh, uh, GLP-1 levels in the gut, remembering that these two peptides derive from the same precursor. So uh, what we can just see here, if we give mice, um, uh, on normal healthy mice, we can see uh, a rapid response in urea. If we remove the pancreatic content of glucagon, we have a significant reduction in the uh, amino acid driven urogenesis. And if we then inject glucagon uh, in, 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 in these um, mice uh, treated with diphtheria toxin and also give an all dose of amino acid, we can actually restore it. So this at least hints to that endogenous glucagon plays a role in, 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 in durogenesis. So the same is seen if we block a glucagon receptor by a glucagon receptor an antagonist. And what you can see here is that urea is significantly reduced, amino acids are um, correspondingly increased, and of course, glucagon is also increased. So this was a nice uh, control experiment, you may say. Um, and in humans, if you block the glucagon receptor, what happens, what I'm showing you here is an acute dosing of a glucagon receptor antagonist in patients with type 2 diabetes here in a white bars and in gray bars controls. And this was done by Sophie Hedersdale from Philip Knob and Tina Wilsch group. And what you can see here is that indeed alanine, again, one of the most potent glucagon tropic uh, amino acids, uh, is uh, significantly changed after a 24 hours treatment with a uh, glucagon receptor. So this is fascinating. So 
Marie also tried to use the glucagon receptor antagonist and uh, saw similar findings. And here in a, um, a short uh, uh, time dependent scale, you can see that this is not hours, this is actually within minutes. So again, uh, this supports the idea that the glucagon driven or enhancing effect on urogenesis is non-transcriptional dependent. And this is a key concept, at least in our mind. She also assessed the hepatic action of glucagon by the perfuse mouse liver. And this is really elegant because here we can actually um, directly assess both what we put in vena porta and then also what is um, uh, derived uh, from uh, or secreted from the mouse liver. So as you can see here, if we put amino acid, urea genesis is increased. If we add glucagon, this is significantly increased uh, compared to your, uh, amino acids alone. So just to summarize here, uh, the first part of my talk, um, I think there is a lot of evidence demonstrating that hyperglucagonemia may exist in individuals with fatty liver disease, independent of diabetes, and that several amino acids in our hands, particular alanine stimulate glucagon both in mice and humans. The glucagon enhances uh, amino acid catabolism via a substrate dependence. So this just means that there needs to be amino acids before it can do anything, urogenesis in mice. And actually we can experimentally by reducing or blocking glucagon action, impair urogenesis. This causes hyperaminoacidemia, increased levels of amino acids and resultingly hyperglucagonemia. So, as I just mentioned in my second slide of the presentation, fatty liver disease is actually a common feature. Uh, every fourth of us has NAFL, and in patients with type 2, two diabetes, up to 75% may actually have NAFL. So in that context, we've been interested in understanding if hepatic steatosis um, or liver disease in general affect this intraorphan crosstalk. So the idea is here that we have impaired actions of glucagon. You can call it glucagon resistant. This is a working hypothesis in our lab. This cause decreased urogenesis, resultingly in increased glucagonotropic amino acids. And this is the causation for the hyperglucagonemia. So let's have a look. What does data tell us? So uh, Marie also measured glucagon levels and amino acid levels in ob, -OB mice. And as you can see here, they are both increased as expectedly. Also that the amino acid induced genesis is actually reduced both uh, in vivo and in primary hepatocyte. And I think this is one of the most elegant uh, experiments, at least in my mind, that is uh, we use the same model, the uh, perfused uh, mouse liver. And uh, what you can see here is um, uh, healthy mice uh, treated with um, amino acids or glucagon alone or glucagon, glucagon with amino acids. And expectedly we see an increase in the glucagon plus amino acid versus the amino acid alone. But if you have hepatic steatosis, so if you have uh, soccer fatty lean rats, the opposite is actually uh, observed. And that is that the glucagon amino acid driven urogenesis is, is reduced. So this is what we call glucagon resistance. We also try to explore the common features of uh, mice with hepatic steatosis and glucagon receptor knockout mice. And this is just a table from the published article that a range of the transcript involved in amino acid catabolism is, is indeed actually reduced in mice uh, with uh, lacking the glucagon receptor or in mice with fatty liver. Some of them, just to mention, I think I'm very fond of CPS1. This is a key regulator in urogenesis. So actually, it's not only the transcript level, it's also the activity that is reduced in the knockout mice, both ob, -OB and uh, glucagon receptor knockout mice. And this is uh, data from uh, one of our liver cohorts at Vidor Hospital showing that the transcript of CPS1 is indeed in, uh, reduced in patients with either cirrhosis or uh, NAFLD. Also replicated in another stat here by our colleagues from uh, Aarhus, Eriksen, and, and so here showing that indeed CPS1 is significantly downregulated. This brings me to this uh, picture that perhaps both hyperglucagonemia and hyperaminoacidemia 
is independent of diabetes, but dependent of nephrogen. Let's have a further look. So to try to understand glucagon uh, resistance or glucagon sensitivity, um, our student, um, Sasha, she is trying to develop a experimental model in humans uh, that uh, aim to uh, develop a, a, a relatively easy test to, uh, to assess glucagon resistance. So, so the setup is that either we give on experimental day one, we give a glucagon a dose, uh, you can see here, this is uh, 200 a microgram. So this is still super physiological, but still within, uh, I, I would say, uh, not the pharmacological levels, but that's a discussion. And the second day is an amino acid infusion. So this is just some preliminary data and we have some lean controls and we have some overweight obese individuals. We also assess their uh, liver fat, of course, by our MRI, state of the art, and you can see they have significant more liver fat compared to the lean. This is what we should expect. But this is very interesting, I believe, because this is the experimental day. And what you can see here that exogenous glucagon administrated after an overnight fast actually reduces uh, levels of amino acids more in individuals with, with uh, fatty liver disease. This is the, um, uh, the black curve, that is the patients with fatty liver disease, and the white curve, that is the healthy controls. Very important is that the effect on glucose levels, in other words, hepatic glucose production, is not different, as you can see in this plot to the right. And this, at least in, in our uh, minds, it, it suggests that there might be differential or biased actions uh, of glucagon in the context of NAPA. This also goes on if we infuse amino acid. You can see here that the plasma concentration of amino acids are uh, significantly increased in the obese individuals compared to the um, lean individuals. Going back to Marie, uh, a wonderful student in our lab, she also showed in our NAPA cohort here, you can see uh, controlled, these were all bio liver biopsy verified that indeed um, steatosis is sufficient to uh, disrupt um, the levels of alanine in this cohort. So um, we also tried to establish a more biomarker based um, uh, marker for glucagon resistance and we call this the glucagon alanine index. And uh, we used um, uh, plasma from uh, uh, roughly uh, 1,400 individuals that has been uh, extremely well characterized both genetically and metabolically. And what you can see here, this is glucagon levels birth, um, based on tertiles. You can see the red one is the one of the highest tertile uh, of, um, of, of NAPLD or HOMA IR. And the same goes on with alanine. So there might be something here demonstrating that if you have some uh, liver, if you have fat in your liver, you disrupt both uh, glucagon as well as alanine levels. So this is what we call the glucagon alanine index. And I think importantly is that this has been uh, replicated in a number of other cohorts. So let's have a look about that. One of them is uh, made internally and that's a, a, another uh, NAFLD cohort, again, showing that there is a stepwise increase in the severity of, of, of NAFLD. And also if you lose weight, if you lose liver fat, you also have a stepwise decrease. So this does not prove, but it suggests that this, there might be something uh, on uh, the um, side of glucagon alanine index um, in the context of fatty liver disease. This is a study from our German collaborators, Christina Gar and colleagues from Munich area also demonstrating that indeed there is a tight correlation between liver fat and look at the ranges here. So this is not nothing to do with NAFLD. Now NAFLD is defined by above liver fat above 5.6%. So, so all these actually, there, there might, the, the liver alpha cell axis may actually be disturbed at a, a quite low levels of liver fat. Um, again, trying to explore this further, uh, we had a, a range, I think it was around 30 individ 40 individuals with um, biopsy verified NAFL. And here we can see a spectrum of NAFL. So this means from mild to severe, including uh, various steps of fibrosis and formation. The key message is here, if you have some sort of liver disease, uh, hepatic steatosis in, in particularly, you have increases in your glucagon alanine index. 
interestingly, after bariatric surgery, and this is all done in humans, um, the uh, levels of, uh, of the marker of glucagon resistance captured by the glucagon alanine index is normalized compared to those with a healthy liver. So this is just a summary that the liver alpha cell axis is a physiological uh, system in which amino acid catabolism is sensed and maintained by glucagon producing alpha cell, that there might exist differential actions of glucagon on amino acid catabolism versus glucose metabolism in patients with NAFLD. The glucagon alanine index may reflect glucagon resistance towards hepatic amino acid catabolism. So we believe that the glucagon alanine index may actually be a similar uh, parameter to assess metabolic diseases in the context of glucagon resistance that HOMA IR is for insulin resistance. So this is, we think this is really exciting. So we hope you will try to validate this in your cohort as well. We are trying to bridge the glucagon sensitivity in humans. And this is quite interesting. It uh, will have some attention at the ADA where Sasha will present the poster and also at the EASD conference, she will have a small, a short talk about it. So please join. Finally, uh, the, the message here to you is that hepatic steatosis impair the liver alpha, alpha cell axis. And this is what drives and causes the hyperglucagonemia seen in a number of patients with type 2 diabetes and nephro. So try to put this together in the context of diabetes. Um, we heard about GLP-1, an important incretin. I'm sure um, uh, my good uh, colleague, John, will tell about uh, GIP, both uh, essential incretins that ensures the uh, glucose-driven uh, insulin secretion. This is in a healthy state. When we progress, when we develop insulin secretion, either due to obesity or perhaps genetically um, uh, susceptible to it, um, we believe that not only will the incretins be reduced as, as shown, both actions and levels will be reduced, but also the liver alpha cell axis may actually push the patients from this, uh, this glycemia towards uh, diabetic hyperglycemia due to the preserved uh, glucose production, uh, glu uh, the, um, uh, due to the preserved action of glucagon on hepatic glucose production, but impaired action on hepatic amino acid catabolism. Then I just need to mention uh, my good colleagues and my mentor, Jens Holz, uh, close, close both mentor and friend. I thank him for everything. Can I feel stop uh, an expert in amino acid catabolism? And, and of course, uh, my, my colleagues and my fellows uh, that have done so many of these experiments. The funding and finally acknowledgement to all people involved in the study. Thank you very much.